Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Pointy Not Sharp. Today we're taking a look at the Swedish model of 1914 bayonet. Now this bayonet is made to fit the model of 1894-14 carbine as well as the uh, model of 1945 Type C submachine gun made by Carl Gustaf. Now these bayonets were made by two different manufacturers. So they were made first by EJAB and later in production Oh man, that does not want to come out. Later in production, Carl Gustaf also made a few as well. Now, it's not clear how many of these were made. So there were 113,000 uh, carbines, model of uh, 1894 carbines made. However, the model of 1894 doesn't take the bayonet. The conversion model 1894-14 takes the bayonet. So it's not clear exactly how many bayonets were made in total and of those carbine, uh, carbine conversions, not all of them took this bayonet. And of the submachine guns, only a very small number were made. So total production of these would be probably less than uh, 100,000, I'd imagine, or maybe around 100,000 mark. Now, these bayonets were in service for quite some time. They entered service in uh, 1915, and uh, they were still used operationally uh, into the mid-1960s and probably beyond that as well. Ceremonially, uh, they are still actually used today by the uh, Royal Guard at the Stockholm Palace. So the guys in the blue out the front of the palace with their little carbines are using this bayonet here. The history of this bayonet. So the original carbine, the model of 1894, did not come with a bayonet or a bayonet lug whatsoever. The initial um, allotment of carbines was made for the cavalry. And it was uh, deemed that they had swords, so there was no need for them to have a bayonet at all. However, the, uh, the cavalry, the artillery, and the navy, they all demanded a bayonet pretty much immediately. It should be noted that uh, this was a period in time where armies were moving away from just being infantry forces to having all of these strange support corps as well. So you have like bicycle soldiers, artillery, and um, all kinds of other random uh, roles that didn't used to exist. or well, they did exist, but not in the same numbers that they do now. And uh, they were all issued with carbines, and they wanted a bayonet to go with what they had. Now, initially, the Navy modified some of their existing rifles to take the model of 1867 Yatagan bayonet. So they already had these bayonets in service from previous rifles. And a couple of uh, very small number of rifles were modified to take this bayonet. But this was a bit of a stopgap. They were still demanding a new bayonet. So in 1909 there were official prototypes and official trials, or prototypes started coming about. So first we had the uh, model 1910 trials bayonet, and um, that came in both a short and a long version. Uh, I don't have a terrible lot of information about those. I've also read that there was a uh, bayonet that was fixed to the rifle and folded out. I'm uncertain if that was the 1910 or if that was another bayonet altogether. Then in uh, 1913, we had the model of 1913 trial bayonet, which is essentially what we have here. There is one minor difference between the 1913 and the model 1914, which they ends up settling on, and that is pretty much just the locking mechanism. So the push button was simplified. In the model 1913, it was uh, circular, and it was simplified into a little rectangle, essentially, making it uh, easier and cheaper to manufacture. But the Model 1913 trial continued through 1913 to 1915. And in 1915, it was adopted and given the name of the Model 1914. So go figure. The uh, Model of 1894 carbine had no provision whatsoever for a bayonet lug. So what they actually had to do was add a nose cap underneath the front of the stock and the barrel. So that particular carbine has a pretty ugly, like a little nose cap on it. Pretty common of a lot of the Mauser carbines from back in the day. Uh, I personally hate the look of them. Some people quite like it, but um, each to their own. Now, this um, little nose cap had a, uh, a false muzzle stud, like the short magazine Lee Enfield. So the, um, what we're gonna call the muzzle ring here on the bayonet doesn't actually fit around the muzzle of the firearm. Instead, it fits around that uh, circular false muzzle stud. 
there are this is actually about the third bayonet I've come across that has uh, that similar kind of design like the uh, the F1 submachine gun here in Australia did something very similar as well so later the uh, M45 submachine guns they didn't take bayonets at all either however the C variation uh, was made to take a bayonet and initially that was only for parade and guard duties However, in uh, 1960, or 63 to 64, Sweden sent uh, UN forces uh, through to the Congo, to the Congo crisis, and um, those submachine guns and bayonets saw extensive use there. Now, there were 300,000 of the M45 submachine guns made, but only a very small number of them were the uh, C configuration that took the bayonet like we have here. So it was certainly not the rule. And uh, the Navy, they didn't particularly like this bayonet as much, so they adopted it at the same time as the Army in 1915. However, almost immediately, they went on to replace it. And they replaced it with the model of 1950 uh, Navy bayonet, which is much longer. So this bayonet here has a 13-inch blade, which is quite long by bayonet standards. It's quite a good length. However, they adopted one with a 19.7-inch blade. Like, that is astronomically huge. Like, chuck another third on the end of that. It's coming out here. Giant bayonet. And uh, that one only has a blade on the top end. Actually, I should point out, this one also only has a blade on the top end. It's got a false edge running down. But like the uh, M95 Munlickers or the uh, VZ24s, we have an upside-down blade. Probably a good time to jump into the construction of the bayonet actually. So, as you can see, it's a blade in the white. Very nice sharp point on it. And uh, we have a false edge running down about one third the length of the blade. And it's unsharpened on this one, but I've read they were sharpened. And then we have a true edge running down the length of the blade. We don't have a fuller, it's like a dagger style blade. And uh, something quite interesting is the finish changes down here. Um, I'm not certain exactly what's happened here. I think it's some kind of machining process. Maybe it's polished down to a point or it's polished in another direction, but they've done something. And there is a very noticeable difference in the blade. And uh, that seems to be consistent with uh, all models of this bayonet. Then moving down, we have only a narrow ricasso, not terribly big, but you'll see here the actual thickness of the blade is quite thick. Um, it's not terribly heavy, but it's got a decent bit of strength to it. Then we have a pretty simple little cross guard, and uh, here we have a little locking mechanism. So, the way this works is uh, it's a locking button, it slides into the scabbard, and that little ramped lug there will click into the, the base of the throat. And then when you depress this, that lowers and it will disengage from the scabbard and it will unlock and you can pull it free. Now, I don't know if it's a common issue, but it's certainly an issue I had with this one. When I got it, it was completely locked. I couldn't get the button to uh, disengage no matter how hard I pressed it. So I actually had to disassemble the, um, the grips completely and uh, unscrew the inside of the button. So the button is one piece and connects about here in the handle by a screw. Disconnected that screw, depressed it down, and it still wouldn't disengage and come out. So I actually had to, while pressing it down, pull it rearwards and out with a pair of pliers. So if this is an issue you have as well, that's possibly one way to fix it. Um, at the time, I thought there was possibly cosmoline or something gunked underneath it, preventing it from being pushed down, but that turned out to not be the case. Now, that's the locking mechanism. Then we have two wooden grip panels, one either side, and uh, they're uniquely shaped, as you'll see. Got a protrusion down there. And uh, they're just retained by two screws. If you do want to remove these screws, make sure you use a screwdriver that fits. I used a gunsmithing kit, and um, it's a very narrow head uh, flathead screw. And then moving down to our pommel, it's quite a unique shape, as you can see. It's rounded off, and um, then we have our T-shaped mortise and our press button. 
and if I can show this on camera, I probably can't, it's very difficult to, to see, but our locking lug is on this side and it's ramped, so it'll slide on the rifle, slowly depress the button across as the uh, bayonet lug goes across the, um, the ramped surface, and then when it passes it, it'll snap into place and lock. So that's the construction of the bayonet. Now I'll take a brief look at the scabbard. I'll take the frog off. So as you can see, it's a steel scabbard, parkerized finish, and uh, we've got uh, one rib either side for strength, or one recess, I don't know if you call it a rib, and a ball finale down the base with no drainage hole. Got a really proud standing um, frog stud, and then we've just got our throat uniquely shaped to accommodate the locking mechanism in either direction, and that's just retained by a rivet either side. Um, I should also point out we have a little recess, if I can get this to focus, there we go, a little recess either side. Now traditionally when you come across these on scabbards, it's to allow a bayonet to be fixed to a rifle, uh, sorry, it's for a bayonet with a scabbard to be fixed to the rifle to stop the throat from being blocked by the, the muzzle of the, uh, the firearm. However, because this doesn't actually connect to the muzzle, I don't know why it has it, and it has it on both sides, but it's there and it's, it's a thing. Finally, in terms of frogs, they'll take pretty much all of the, um, the Swedish frogs. Um, Swedish frogs are very, very common. They usually come in the brown leather. Uh, this one here is a cavalry uh, frog. So as you can see, it sits at a 45 degree angle and hangs from the belt down there. Being white, it's also a parade frog. So I'll show you how it works. In you go. That goes through there. Around you go. The clicks clips on there. Now I don't know why this retaining strap is really necessary when we have a push button as well, but that is an incredibly secure bayonet that is not going to go anywhere at all. So the cavalry frogs themselves are much more difficult to find. The parade ones again very hard to find, so I'm quite happy to have this one here. Now finally we'll cover off the markings. So I'll pull it back out. Oh, that is so stiff. That does not like coming out. So, first off, manufacturer's markings. This one here was manufactured by um, EJAB, and uh, as you can see, it's on the right Ricasso. If it was manufactured by Carl Gustav, it would be on the left Ricasso, just above the uh, locking mechanism. Next we have unit markings, so on this one it's on the right cross guard and I'll put a photo up, but what it says is 1 slash KI number 593. So what that is, is the 1st Lifeguards uh, Horse Cavalry Regiment. I don't know why they call called the Lifeguards Regiment, but that's what they're called. And the 593 is the weapon number within that unit. So they're easy enough to figure out. You got your regimental number, type of regiment, and then the number of rifle within that regiment. Pretty easy. And finally, the only other markings you have are little proof marks, and they are littered absolutely everywhere. Like we've got one here on the tang, it's just a crown. You've got one here on the side of the press button. You've got one on the other side of the uh, the button. Where else? I was finding these absolutely everywhere. Down here underneath the, um, the cross guard, if I can get that to focus, I probably can't. I might have taken my word for it, it's just a little crown. And from memory, I had one, yep, down here on the ball finale as well. And Pretty much the longer you look at these, you just keep finding these little crowns everywhere and they're little proof or inspection marks for almost each individual piece that was manufactured. So yeah, that's uh, these bayonets in a nutshell. They're uh, really, really nice. Um, personally, I didn't like them very much when I first uh, saw them. 
But since I've had this one, they've really, really grown on me. Now, unfortunately, there are a lot of fakes of these. Uh, for whatever reason, someone decided to be profitable to manufacture a whole bunch of uh, fakes. And uh, I've seen two kinds. So I've seen the kind with a brass handle that says bayonet, which is just, if you're buying that and you think that's legitimate, you deserve to be ripped off. And then there's a much more subtle one as well, uh, which looks a lot more legitimate, but the devil's in the detail. The workman, workmanship's not up to uh, scratch. It doesn't have the markings and um, yeah, they're, they're a bit tougher to spot. So I'll chuck some photos up. Hopefully you can um, spot the difference yourself. Anyway, guys, this is a bayonet that I didn't expect to like, but really do now. So um, if you've got any other information or uh, I've missed anything, feel free to comment below. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. I've got a lot more content coming, a lot more interesting bayonets to see. Anyway, guys, that's all I have for you today. Thanks for watching.